So I must thank the Cambridge University Press to have conceived this idea of a webinar and then invited me to come and speak to your audience. That's very kind of you. I've always enjoyed my interaction with the Cambridge University Press, be it the book that we published together, and now this experience or other things that uh, uh, Ms. Anvesha and uh, Ms. Putsia have been um, organizing. So thanks again. Now the topic is very vast, so I'll go to you know, the topic right away and share some of my thoughts. And then of course, I'm more than happy to take questions at the end and uh, if I can, I'll try to answer and if I, if I can't, probably I'll ponder over it and at some point of time, put it on Twitter or somewhere. So let me start with where are we right now and what is happening to us right now. So we'll analyze the situation and after we have analyzed the situation, then I'm going to walk you with uh, different sectors, my opinion on different sectors. And then of course, we will conclude and then we'll take the questions and maybe we will evolve. Let me at the beginning confess to you that uh, this is an unprecedented thing that has happened. And therefore knowledge base of everybody, including the economist and certainly myself is very limited. So we are all thinking together in this whole highly dynamic and totally uncertain environment. And you will see during the course of my presentation that what I'm saying is I'm meaning it because these are really challenging times. So the issue is where are we right now? And is it really that challenging? Now, if you remember before the pandemic hit us, we were growing around 4.5 to 5% uh, annual rate of growth. And if you recollect, the debate was that we are growing at a much lower rate and we need to be growing at 7 to 8%. And when we grow at 7 to 8%, even that is low, we are actually, we need to grow around 10%. Because our demographic situation is such, you so many youth in the country, we have to create jobs for them and we have to create a conducive environment for them so that employment is generated and they can find meaningful uh, jobs. Not only meaningful jobs, you know the Prime Minister of our country, he had said that we should be a $5 trillion economy in the next five years. So the whole country has been thinking and thinking how to make that $5 trillion dream of the Prime Minister come true. And if you know, uh, America is a $20 trillion economy and China is nearly a $13 trillion economy. And if we have to recover our global position, $5 trillion economy is not just our objective. It is just a milestone we have to keep moving. And I'm sure you are aware that in 1980, India and China were almost at par. America at that time was a $2.8 trillion economy, something which we are today. And China was around $191 billion economy. And India was a $186 billion economy. So India and China were almost at par. America was $2.8 trillion economy. And of course, Germany was also around one point some trillion dollar economy. Today, the things have changed. America has become a $20 trillion economy. China about $13 to $14 trillion economy. India is 2.8 to $3 trillion. We wanted to become a five and take off from there. This was the scenario before COVID hit us. Now what happened? Something unique happened. This is not something which can be found parallel. We all are aware of the 2008 crisis. The epicenter was the USA and the housing sector was the crux, the pivot from where the whole thing happened. We all know that. But you must be aware that in 2008, the epicenter was America, but the world was moving on. And then there was a contagion and went to Europe. And then it came down to other emerging countries, as you would expect in any spillovers that happen because the world is co-integrated and spillovers do take place. Their growth means our exports and so on and so forth. But this time is different. This time, at a single date, the whole world is closed. Delhi is closed. Noida is closed. Bombay is closed. Lucknow is closed. 
India is closed. London is closed. New York is closed. Germany and France are closed. So the planet is closed. Now what happens? When there is a contingent traveling, like in 2008, you have one country in crisis, other countries, the engines are moving, growth is taking place. But now, when everybody is closed, whom do you seek help from? Where would you get assistance from? Everybody is struggling within their own economy so that their population and their finances and their monetary policy and their businesses, industries and MSMEs can operate so very unique situation that has happened. The world has become flat and the world is closed simultaneously at the same time. That aspect needs to be appreciated before we start thinking, you know, I can borrow from America, I can borrow from Germany. Yes, they're rich countries, they're advanced countries, their resilience is much more, but they are also struggling within their own economies. The second thing, then, we have to consider is, and looking close at it, is the pandemic of 1918. The pandemic of 1918, if you look into history, came in different waves. And the different waves that it came in were very educated. Take as an illustration, wave one, X is the fatality rate or the mortality, X. Wave two, 5x, wave 3, 2x. So that means that the next wave is far more lethal and the third wave may not be as lethal as the second wave but will not be as benign as the first wave. So therefore, one has to be prepared for it. Now, the issue is how long do these waves last? These waves can last for 18 months to nearly two years. That's a long time. And therefore, any economy has to prepare for a long haul. Just can't say that 60 days of lockdown means now we are going to recover, everything is hunky-dory, and we can start the engines again. That's now how simple these pandemics work. They come every 100, 150 years, but they leave a mark. They change the course of direction in which the human race moves and works. So keeping these two things in mind, that this is not like the 2008, this is more like the 1918, and this can happen in waves, we need to start analyzing how the economy should be moving forward. What should the government be doing and what should the monetary authority be doing? So we will correct it as we go forward. Now the issue is fine. We know we were growing around 4.5 to 5%. Fine, we know this is going to come in waves. These waves can last 18 months, two years. This is beautiful. We know it now. Now what? So different agencies have made different estimates. The IMF and the World Bank came out with an estimate in April saying that India will be the fastest growing economy, but the growth rate will be only 1.9%. There are other private agencies who said we could probably get into negative zones. I did a study which is at the Egro Foundation and uh, my colleagues at the Egro Foundation have also done their studies. Our chairman is one Dr. Girmani, who was the former chief economic advisor of government of India and had worked at the ED. He has also done an estimation. These are all available. My other colleagues in the agriculture and health sector have also done their studies, and those are also at the EGRO Foundation website. You're welcome to see it. We are of the opinion at EGRO that we may not go into the negative side. The different estimates, different assumptions, and I can just share with you my own assumption. For others, you're welcome to look at our website. My own assumption has been that 60 days of lockout, but during this 60 days, everything was not closed. About 37 to 40 percent 
of the economy was working. Who was working? Medical services are working. Banking is working. Defense is working. Police and government administration is working. Secondly, schools and colleges have not really closed. Online classes are on. Many IT companies have not closed either. And many other companies have not closed either totally. Closed physically, yes. But people are working from home. And my own reading has been, if earlier they were working 8 to 10 hours, now they're working 12 to 16 hours from home. So output, to that extent, measurable, has been increased. The second thing I am on, I am of the view that in India, we have something called, we divide the year. Of course, there are four seasons, but we divide as an economist into two parts, the lean season and the busy season. The lean season, lean season is the severe heat that our country gets and then the monsoon that follows it. You know, in monsoon, construction activities generally don't take place. In severe heat, daytime working hours get to a certain extent limited. So we call it the lean season. The busy season starts from September and goes till March. It has all the festivals into it. So the lockdown has taken place during the lean season, when as it is, activities used to be restricted. So therefore, the damage to the economy is going to be far more less. Had it happened in the busy season, that would have been very, very devastating. Of course, I've just told you the wave theory that I'm worried about. But yes, given that the medical profession, the hospitals has had time to prepare for it, to some extent, we'll be able to contain. The vaccine is still far away. But fortunately, Indians, with the type of food habits that they have, the herbs and the spices which are interwoven into our food are probably going to hold us on because that would have strengthened our immunity. As you already know, this is something more severe than the flu, but this will stay with us for the rest of our life. And so therefore, herd immunity has to be built in, and that probably will get built in over time. But then the immunity system that the Indians have because of their heavy usage of herbs and spices is probably going to help us bail out. Precautions, of course, have to be taken. People have learned, everybody has learned, 50 crore working population, which is vulnerable to the disease, 11 crore elderly who are staying generally at home and are about 60 years, and these working population can pass it on to the vulnerables more easily. People with morbid habits are more vulnerable. So given all the stories that we have seen, the empirical work that we have seen, what has happened in the Western world we have seen, we are prepared. So immunity as well as preparedness and precaution probably will help us build herd immunity faster. At least the mortality rate would not be as high as seen there because we are prepared for it. Given the scenario that I've just narrated that we are in the lean period. The third thing that I have a feeling, Indians, by virtue of their hardworking nature, can probably consider enhanced working hours after the lockdown is opened. So we have lost 60 full days in the lean season, which can be treated as front loading of the holiday period, summer vacations, Christmas vacations, Diwali, Dosera, holy, holy vacations, can be seen as front loading and rest of the year, we can instead of working eight hours shifts, we can work 12 hours shifts. And if there is demand which gets created, and I think it should get created, well, nothing structural has changed. This was a disease which came and we had to take precautions. So demand should come back. I think even if we have to work longer, we should be able to do it and we'll be able to recover and recoup the lost I'll come to in the fiscal issues and other issues, I'll come with more suggestions. But my view is that we should not be too worried that we will go into the negative zone. My reading is we will stay in the positive zone. We will zoom back. We will recover and recoup. And with the hardworking nature that we have, probably we will need government support. Our MSMEs, our industry will need government support to work shifts which are a little longer day uh, and given the sunlight uh, hours that are in our country, we need not just restrict ourselves to 10 to 6 working, 8 hours shift. We can probably start at 8 and close at 8. And that will help us recover. That will also engage the labor. That will also give them higher wages. 
that pump in purchasing power in their own hands. So therefore, I hope the labor unions will understand and probably as the UP government has done it, some other governments have done, prolong the working day and recover it. Now I want to talk about a little bit about the areas. We all know what has suffered. Tourism, travel, airlines, hotels, restaurants, severely, severely in crisis. And we also know that we don't see in, in the next one year that they will open up. And if there's a wave theory which is true, obviously they'll not be able to open up within such a short time. Because there'll be fears which reinforce and therefore air travel, train travel, bus travel would get impacted. Now, that is, that is where in, I think there's an opportunity also. Now take this example of, is just an illustration and we can go deeper if we have time, but this is just an illustration. If public transport would not be favored by the office going staff now, and of course many will start working from home which they're already, and that'll get continued. If public transport would not be the favored mode of transport, what is going to happen? People are going to prefer two wheelers and therefore the two wheeler industry is going to get a boom. Now two wheelers could be motorized or could be bicycles depending on the place uh, you are working at. So if it is bicycles, it's environmental friendly. If it is motorized, then of course public transport suffers, but then lots of people get employed into two wheeler industry. There's a possibility that people who are right now enjoying the two wheelers would like to shift to, and probability much higher, would like to shift to a four-wheeler, but the lower end of the four-wheelers, small cars. So I see a lot of boom, even in the small cars industry. Over and above it, this COVID-19 can offer great opportunities for uh, industry and in the service. Now, what could be these opportunities? Firstly, you know that for 16 to 18 months, if this is going to last, the awareness of medical facilities is going to go up. So we would be looking for far more clinics, small hospitals, and specialized hospitals across the country. They would have to be built and they'll have to be provided. Pharmaceuticals products will increase tremendously. We will have to now make it. And in many countries, even before COVID-19, if you remember in Japan, in Tokyo, during peak hours, people wear masks. I think that's going to become a trend in our country. Mask is going to become important, different types of masks, fashion masks, with the dress, with the turban, whatever you call it. I think masks have, are going to add something to the fashion industry as well as accessories. People are going to work from home. Right now, all our dressing pattern, the wardrobes used to be office and home. Now it is going to be a little mixed. If I'm going to working from home, my wardrobe is going to change. So the fashion industry is going to swing into action and give me those comfortable wears where I can do Zoom sitting at home. I need not be dressed in a suit and a tie and a coat, but I need not be even dressed in a lungi. So the fashion industry is going to, and, uh, and textile industry is going to get lots of. In addition to all this, you will see that people working from home, would they be cooking at home? I'm not sure. So I think the hotels which may not be able to make people sit together now, they would be, they'll become big takeaways. And when they become big takeaways, the, they are going to be serving lunches to people in large numbers at homes and they will need delivery boys who will have to deliver these things. So there are opportunities which are going to come up. The conferences are going to happen digitally now the way we are doing. And therefore many more programs, packages and digital platforms will have to be generated, which will take care of all these requirements of modern conferences that will take place. Humans are social animals. They may not be able to play soccer now. They may not be able to play cricket in the, in the field for the next 18 months, but I'm sure the computer world is going to generate for us games, which I could be sitting in my room, somebody in another house, and we could be interacting and playing games. So many more IT related activities are going to get a boost. Similarly, yes, we may not be able to go to the gyms and enjoy together doing our exercises, but I'm sure single home gyms or equipment that can be bought and used for training is going to come up. 
many more such innovative activities will come. And let me give you a few more illustrations before I go further. You know that in our country, which was known for qualities of the hand, take an example of a weaver, handloom weaver, khadi, village and cottage industry, sculptures. These are the people who have qualities of hands. In this race to modernism, we had started the power looms and huge industries, but the migrant labor has gone back to their native place. We have to keep them engaged and they are not small. The total labor force in the country is 50 crore, 10 crore are migrant laborers. They are not a small number. Many of them are well trained in their local profession, in their local vocation, because they were not having opportunities. They came to big cities and in the big cities, they compromised. And what they were doing, they became head load workers, vegetable vendors. And some of them got into construction activities. Some of them became masons and some simply laborers. Some became watchmen. They had the qualities. Once they're back into their villages, I think we have to remember one simple thing. Gandhiji, after traveling abroad, 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, said, strengthen the village. Strengthen the village economy. Strengthen the ecosystem around the village. And I think that's exactly what we need to do now. We have cooperative banks. We have other institutions. We can tell them to fund a sculpture needs just 10,000 rupees. He can build a sculpture. He can employ different people, two to three people he can employ. And within 10,000 rupees, you have not only kept them engaged, you have not only encouraged Indian arts, you have also created employment. Similarly, the weaver, the khadi, the cottage industry, they have so much of strength, so much of art, so much of skill. Little resources given to them, they will create local employment, they'll stay engaged, and then you can pump in purchasing power at the initial stage, and the cycle will start. Remember, just a few years back, we were talking about smart cities. And I'm talking exactly of that. We need to combine that idea of smart cities. Now, looking at the situation of the migrant labor, if in each state we are able to develop, like in Karnataka, Bangalore, like in Andhra, Hyderabad, like in Tamil Nadu, Chennai, if we end Maharashtra, Bombay, if in every state we can identify one city, create it into a smart city, attract foreign investment there, like the export processing zone, and that will take care of the local employment. We have all types of cities in our country. We have urban areas, Maharashtra and Gujarat. We have mining areas, Jharkhand and Bihar. We have green belts in Northeast. We have post port related, seaport related cities along the coastline. So we have enough resources. And if we create smart cities there and take this simple example, we say we are going to create a city, a smart city with the facilities of the export processing zone and we are going to get Boeing to come in and establish its first unit. And then the ancillary units come and then the others come and that city becomes a Boeing hub like Bangalore, Hyderabad became the IT hub. So across the city, we can do it. We could also have, we could also have medical tourism. We could also have religious tourism. Have you thought ever that in our country, Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, Sikhism, four major religions of the world started. And therefore, places of religious tourism on these four religions abound. So we could promote that. And of course, when we say that tourism is suffering, but we could have a new type of tourism that we can promote in our own country. So if we create these sort of activities within our country, we are going to create employment opportunities and we are going to have growth orientation within our own country. So therefore, the worry that uh, we would then not know that the global markets have dried up, we do not know whom to export, I don't think that should be our worry. I haven't spoken to you about medical tourism. According to modern science, medical tourism means where I can go and get my heart fixed or my teeth fixed. No, 
I'm thinking from a different angle. I'm thinking a country which has a civilization of 5,000 years must have seen such attacks like the pandemics many, many times. The DNA is strong. But the key thing is our yoga and our pristine mountains. And in those pristine mountains, what do we have? We have ashrams. So my own reading is that we can start medical tourism with a different connotation. Come, we have the basic amenities. Come enrich your lungs. Have the most purified air. You have the best sites. You have the river flowing next door. You have an ashram. You live in a mountain. You do pranana, pranayams, breathing exercises, which strengthen you so that you don't fall prey to medical ailments. I am not looking for medical tourism, which comes from under an ailment to an hospital gets treated and goes away, like has been happening in Bombay, where the, uh, from the Middle East people come. I'm looking for medical tourism where people come healthy, become healthier, and go back and stay healthier. And then they come back. And I have, keep, I have in mind those green places, those mountains and places like Rishikesh, where on one side the river is flowing and you can see Ganges at its region. And then you stay in an ashram where everything is provided for. So these sort of new innovative out-of-box activities can lead to a reset button on which I'm going to come in my concluding session. Now the issue is, how do, how do we go about the fiscal situation? And the 20 lakh crore, the stimulus package which the government has given. I, I follow a very simple hypothesis. I say in a country like America, where people have been contributing tax to GDP ratio to the range of 35 to 40% in UK and other countries of uh, Europe. There are places where the tax to GDP ratio is even about 40%. In our country, it is less than 18%. Despite all type of efforts which we have been doing in the past, tax um, amenities and all that, tax GDP ratio never goes up. And when I talk of tax GDP ratio, I'm talking of central states, local bodies, every tax put together in the kitty and then measuring it against the GDP. If it is 17 to 18% of tax to GDP ratio, then this is the best the government can do. You can't expect not to co pay taxes, but expect the government to give you all the relief. The government is thinking about it, has taken precautions, came well in advance as far as the lockdown is concerned, prepared the medical fraternity to prepare for all the challenges that can come in the way. They're doing their very best. But you have to also keep in mind that yes, they have not only to prepare for the current wave, they are also facing the same amount of uncertainty as you and me are facing. If the pandemic lasts a little longer, they have to keep the powder dry and they have to be prepared that in the long run, if they have to handle the country, which is the size of a continent or even more than a few continents, the population is so large, they have to keep prepared for it. And I think that's exactly what they're doing. So rather than criticizing the government all the time, saying that, oh, effectively their um, stimulus package is just 1% of GDP, I think one has to rethink and stop criticizing the government. Rather, I would say the prime minister of the country is very popular. He has used his personal charisma, like in 60s, Lal Bahadur Shastri had used it once, saying that, can you please give up one meal a day, uh, one meal a week, so that everybody can be fed. He has used his personal charisma and said, can the private sector please not uh, throw away people, keep them employed, continue to give them salaries. And the private sector paid heed to what he said, respected his view. And if you add the wages that have been paid for the month of March and April and May to the stimulus, you will realize that stimulus is really very good when public private is put together. Unlike America, where 35 million people are out of jobs, then no employer is paying them, but they are on the unemployment allowance of the government, which makes the package go bigger. So one has to think in which country, in what context this is being discussed, and then say, yes, we are doing the very best that we can do. As far as the Reserve Bank is concerned, they've come up with a monetary policy. I have my own views on it. But again, I think, and which are there at the Eagle Foundation, you can see it for yourself. But I'm again of the view that the Reserve Bank is also preparing for a long haul. And therefore, when they are reducing their interest rates in measured tones, one has to respect that. 
very very uncertain time both production and inflation and from an institution of the reserve bank central banks are generally conservative i think they are playing they are doing a good job financial institutions the banking now what is banking for example what is a government government collect taxes and spends it that's exactly what they are doing government can borrow but when it borrows it engages the it engages the future generations because i'll benefit but future generations have to pay and they have to also pay interest but to borrow when i in the beginning introduced most of the countries are in a similar situation like we are the world is flat they are struggling with their, within their own economies to give allowances to their own people so borrowing is not going to be that easy a task they can borrow from the reserve bank yes they can but as i said probably they're planning a long horizon long haul and how much to borrow from the reserve bank when to borrow partly they have started if you look at the ways and means advances which is lending to the state governments the reserve bank has already made it very liberal and number of days as well as the amounts so the thought is there now one more thing which i wanted to bring to your notice i missed it earlier when i was talking that why i think we will be the positive so is the agriculture sector the agriculture sector engages nearly 55% of the population and agriculture sector has not been much impacted by the pandemic the rabi crop which has been harvested just about a month back was a record crop food corporation of india played its role food uh, the fair price shops 5 5 lakh of them distributing food across the country the kharif crop the sowing for which has to start now given the good forecast of southwest monsoon i don't see a problem so therefore the agriculture sector is going to grow at its normal pace or maybe little higher which is very good so it will be in the positive zone and already engages and supports 55% of the population many of the migrant laborers which have gone back will get absorbed in some capacity or the other at least in a disguised uh, way but they'll be in the other thing which i wanted to speak is about the migrant labors now when we say that unorganized economy in the country is nearly 90% people are working in the unorganized sector yes but when they are earning and living hand to mouth they earn during the day and on their return home they buy food and then they eat that what the government did is the government started providing free food for a large chunk of the society somewhere it did not reach in the initial stages but later on it took care and then the government also requested the ngo the mandirs the gurdwaras local trust to provide food even local industry started providing food so the government to that extent it showed that while the earning capacity of the labor has gone down and people in the unorganized sector has gone down at least food is provided to them to uh, to some extent providing that security medical security of course Uh, again the private sector uh, hospitals were zoomed in and said they have to cooperate and coordinate i would like to now start my closing uh, remarks i would like to bring to your notice that industry depends on artificial intelligence machine learning automation and that obviously had started much earlier with the migrant labor going back there is a probability that the industry will have to adapt in the western world has adapted to a great great extent probably will have to adapt the large industry to these two as far as msmes are concerned as i mentioned that little amount of money can start engagement and employment of more than 2 to 3 people that i think will have to be the case msmes there are 6 crore of them right now employing 12 crore of people have a very high mortality rate many of them are not registered many of them are registered with the power sector but not with the gst so therefore msmes is a challenging area which we have to address different efforts have been made by different governments over a period of time to strengthen the msmes i have a different take on this i am saying a time has come when we need state wise msme universities on the lines of agricultural universities 
remember in 60s we were not self dependent on food and we would have to wait for food to come in a ship from america or australia many of us remember the pl public law 480 and how we started the green revolution the compulsion in every state agriculture universities was started and now today we are food surplus food corporation of india has food not only to feed the humans but even many rats and four legged animals and all sort of things happen you must have read the report which came out in 2014 about the food corporation that means enough surplus stocks are lying in the food corporation of india so much we have gone ahead i think 6000 commodities products which are produced in msmes they need to be and many of them are state specific there is something kolapuri chappal jaipuri rajai then something in punjab fulkari then something in kerala something in karnataka each one of the states have some special material for msmes the, like the agriculture products so if we have msme universities imparting education in local language and msme university is not an iti which te- which teaches you how to do good plumbing or become a good electrician msme university is not an iim which teaches you to become a manager in goldman sachs or jp morgan msme university teaches you how to be an entrepreneur and how to handle the supply chain create your own supply chain know about the markets input and output know about accounting laws know about labor laws know how to run the entrepreneur firm know about the human resources know about accounting and maintaining accounts that sort of msme university which trains like you have a defense academy which trains an individual to become a soldier and officer you need msme universities which are academies to generate entrepreneurs we need them we will not be able to absorb the type of demographic that we have in our country in organized labor in terms of defense or civil services now i want to close by making two observations one is i'm looking at covid-19 as a great opportunity for india and what that opportunity is i will come back to you after this statement i think covid-19 has made all of us think economists public policy makers everybody philosophers according to me the big philosophical change that i see from covid-19 which has a bearing on economics and i'll show you the parallels is that we need to reset and what what is that we need to reset live and let live we always believe live and let live is only applicable within a family or within a society the philosophical understanding that i am getting now is live and let live is for the planet and for the universe we have to start thinking this planet on the top of the food chain may be humans but there's a complete food chain right below us and we have to take care of it we have to live and we have to let live they have as much right birds plants animals fishes whales they have as much right on this planet as we humans have so monopolizing the planet and pushing everybody at the cost is not what the nature is going to permit us and i think that is the reset button that has happened the second reset button is that this civilization which is 5000 years old has something which needs to be treasured and which needs to be shared with the world so now let me give you the economic implications of what i have just said so far the world had one single country which was monopolizing production and manufacturing and the world realized that the supply chains get quickly disrupted if something happens in one single country in banking we call it concentration risk in general life we say don't place all your eggs in the same basket 
India should now position itself as an alternative, given its demographic strength, given its democratic powers, given its English and computer and Sanskrit bearings. We are far better and have better landmass and better country with ports and mountains and green and everything than Vietnam, Estonia, Bangladesh, or Mexico. We need to position ourselves. The second thing, Indian civilization has survived 5,000 years by ensuring that the plant, the flora, and the fauna are part of the civilization. There are gods which are related to animals, plants, and birds. There are days earmarked for birds, for trees, for animals where they're worshipped. The point is that the Indian civilization which survived 5,000 years could only survive because it had respect for everything around it. The animals, plants, and birds were part of the ecosystem. They were respected. I think that's where the world has to realize that we have to ensure environmental concerns. We cannot in the rat race of development trample the environmental concerns. And the environmental concerns don't just start by killing every animal in the jungle. It starts from preserving, respecting air, water, and earth. That greed that we had or we were trying to demonstrate we have in the rat race has to stop. And not only that, we had left our planet and taken our deceptive weapons to the space and started fighting wars there and throwing debris there. I think the reset button is that the civilization which lasted 5,000 years learn from it, respect the environment and learn to live on the planet with contentment. There's economic implications of that, which I've just mentioned. Let me conclude my presentation here, and I'm happy to take questions uh, now. Thank you. Uh, yes, Professor Singh, there are a, a number of questions. So let us begin at the beginning with the first question, which is, uh, should banks give interest-free loans to farmers and migrant workers? This has come in from Facebook Live. Sure. Means my own view is that when you want to create employment and when you have Aadhaar linked almost everybody and you have opened the Jandan account, so initially the banks were reluctant to give loans because they would not know whom are we giving, what his track record is, where will we move on? We had no idea. But now that everybody is Aadhaar linked, ration cards are going to be made, which will be national ration cards. So we would know exactly who is where. So if you are pump priming the system, I see no reason why at the beginning of the cycle, when you have all the details of the individual, you can't lend small amount of money. And as I mentioned, that we want to strengthen the village economy, cottage industry, and they are there, we should be prepared to give little amount of money and start the system. As far as the larger amounts and larger industries are concerned, you know that they are more resilient, they're far more responsible, they have plant and machinery sitting there, so it just can't vanish and evaporate. So therefore, I think when you pump prime the system, you may have to take little risk, but yes, for larger amounts, you may need a collateral. For smaller amounts, I think you should be prepared to lend an extent. Cooperative okay. banks, macrofinance institutions, self-help groups, NABAD has a network of officers, SIDB and commercial banks. All of them have a network spread out across the country and they can be tapped to start this cycle again. I would like our local artisans with their local skills to be encouraged. That will take India far ahead. That is, uh, uh, thank you for responding to that. I would just like to add on to this that, uh, you know, of course, uh, local artisans can help in a lot of ways. But right now, the situation that we see in the country, you know, a lot of people are without jobs, without food. And uh, 
don't you think that we are kind of shifting the owners from the people in charge uh, and uh, a lot of people have asked questions about migrant laborers and informal sector so i'm kind of combining all of that into this question that uh, do, do you feel that we are also shifting the owners from the actual people in charge whether it is the government or whether these are uh, large corporations who were capable of making more of a difference and moving it on to people and we are talking about being self sufficient or not there are also other questions on workers in the informal sector especially and uh, how we are thinking about helping them uh government needs to be careful in shuffling their policy pointers to address these issues and uh, the skills of migrant laborers overall and uh, how the lockdown has impacted the vulnerable sections of the society so would you want to address the uh, these points together okay. that uh, the government has somewhere perhaps not been very judicious in keeping in mind whom they need to help the most couple of issues that i would like to mention here first of all i agree to some extent that in our country the central government and the state governments have swung into action quite active we have been hearing them we have been seeing them on television we see the prime minister on television we see the chief minister on television i have always wondered how about the local authorities they are also elected representatives panchayati raj institutions municipal corporations municipal councils where are they and they are the closest to the people they live in the same area the parliamentarian goes and works in delhi the legislate uh, the person who is in the state legislation legislature he goes and works in the state capital but the local panchayat or the local municipal municipal corporation person is living there he knows all the people he knows in which house how many people he knows in which house there is no food he knows in how, which house there are elderly in which house how many labor hands are available very close to the people so i think local authorities we had done the amendment 70 third 74th amendment long time ago i think that needs to be strengthened and therefore i think that tier of the government has not shown up as aggressively as it should have well they would had they shown up then these problems of uh, distribution of food or medicines not reaching everybody wouldn't have really come up the second point that i am of the view all of us have bandaid at home we have some aspirin or crocine at home the clinics and the hospitals come later all of us have umbrella at home we have to have an umbrella approach something we have to do ourselves and something then we can expect the others to do in our case i have always observed that not only before covid if you read my articles much before that i have always said that we are very reluctant to pay taxes to the government but in any event that happens our first reaction is why is the government not bailing me out it's very strange we never contribute but we want everybody else to come and bail me out who will come and bail you out some tax payers money is getting engaged and involved so i think the government as far as i think i've already told you the third year did not swing into action it should have swung into action but i also think from this time onwards people should start thinking that tax collections have are meant to build infrastructure which then help in times of crisis if americans have been paying 35% of tax to gdp ratio they can expect a 10% bailout if we have been paying only 18% just survival rate that helps the government maintain the police judiciary defense coin and currency or something like that you can't expect to know. as it is we are in an emerging country and in an emerging country the resilience is much less obviously as expected the last point that i want to make is yes migrant labor is very vulnerable and that is why i have said instead of having migrant labor move from bihar jharkhand to bangalore to delhi to punjab why not we develop local hubs so the migrant labor will move within the state to the local hub which is 4 5 hours away from their home town and therefore this sort of a problem and challenge that we have seen will not come up i have also suggested in my talk to create employment opportunities at the village level and the city level where i am talking of village and cottage industries strengthen the villages as uh, mahatma gandhi used to say i am also talking of smart cities creating bangalore and hyderabad in every state and every state administration and government 
has to now identify what is the area which is the industry and where are they going to invite it taxes instrument went to bangalore why could taxes instruments not come to another state so the governments have to start there so we'll have to do a multi layer analysis and a multi pronged strategy to see that this doesn't happen in future Uh, this is thing. There are a lot of questions here, but I recall that you had mentioned you have another engagement at four. So before we close, a final question. Um, you have mentioned that uh, there should be MSME universities and so on, and there is a question related to that. Small businesses have been severely affected by the crisis, and recently the prime uh, finance minister has announced schemes. But to what extent will these schemes actually benefit the small businesses? And would you recommend that any specific strategies? be followed for small businesses or anything a uh, particular specific uh, theoretical perspective that might be useful in assessing the future of small businesses in india look uh, on this this is actually a very long question and it is a very complex question because when you say small businesses they are the most complex 6000 items are produced by these small businesses some of them are single entrepreneur some of them employ nearly 300 people it's a very complex it ranges from mudra to the medium uh, in the small and medium extend loans moratoriums have been extended but i have a suggestion here for the government i have said when you are in crisis you don't take a loan you need a grant you need support so i think that is where we will have to go from the government angle you have to see where do they have the money and given the track record how much can they sink somewhere it's something like a loan waiver can you encourage the loan waiver culture because beyond 18 months the country has to survive the government and the monetary regulator has to survive and therefore they have to plan in terms of next 100 years they just can't plan for and say okay i exhaust all my i open my treasury and give you all the money they can't do like that so it is a difficult question a balance is being tried some money is being extended moratoriums are being extended interest rates have been reduced uncollateralized money to a certain extent is being offered all that is being attempted but beyond it i don't think we can do too much who should play a role now i think mfis self help groups have a role to play i think family has a role to play and we need to be more supportive to each other the community has a role to play and help each other the local artisans can be supported by the community community banks cooperative banks that is where i think we all have to come together it's not it's not 2008 it is a pandemic we all stay together stay united and stay under one tree you know when forest fires break out under a single tree all types of birds and animals come and stay there supporting each other this is the time to melt away differences and come together each one will have to do something or the other for each other so i don't think government can only help and bail us out we will have to bail ourselves too thank you for the thing for that uh, there were a lot of questions perhaps uh, i have compiled all of that perhaps i could send it to you and uh, because you write very frequently perhaps uh, you could address all of those in the next few articles that you are planning to write i would uh, now i would just thank you for joining us today and also to the all the participants and we need to go now but uh, thanks again professor singh for your presence and also uh, for reassuring a lot of us in these very difficult times for making it very relatable to a lot of participants thank you very much giving me this opportunity and i am of a firm view that the 5000 year old civilization must have seen many such things happening and the dna is strong enough to come out of it with resolve strength and better it it's a reset button look at india follow india respect the environment live and let live like the indians have done all these years thank you very much